Well, there are two issues in the pet food industry, two big issues that I think it's important for every pet parent to understand. Giving your dog a vaccine over and over and over and over has been demonstrated to not be a benefit. Once a dog is immunized and protected, they're protected. Veterinarians don't know this and veterinarians mistreat Lyme exposure for Lyme infection all the time. Karen, what would you recommend to somebody tuning in right now? What would be the number one thing for somebody that wants their dog to live a healthy and long life? Pay very close attention to the animal in front of you. I think that if we tune in to our animals as they go through life, if we really focus on how they see life and how they're feeling life and the symptoms that they're giving us, I think that that's the, if we can be in tune with our animals, that's the best gift we can give them. I like that. Not the answer I was expecting. Let's go even further into the details on that. So for somebody that wants to be more tuned in, what specific symptoms are they looking for? Any symptoms. Remember, the body gives us symptoms as kind of a no, I don't want to say a warning, but we're because our dogs don't speak English fluently in sentences and kitties either, because, because we can't say, you know what, I have a headache today. And that's how we would communicate is be is yes, in addition to maybe physically rubbing our temples, or you know, you you can kind of tell when someone's in pain, facial expression, grimace, you can see that people are in pain. But if our animals, if we've had them long enough. And if we've lived, coexisted with them in the same house and we're watching them, we know what's normal for them. And then out of what we know as normal, we know what's abnormal. And so anything, and really, Jesse, for me, it's as subtle as um, animals, it's as subtle as my own animals uh, hesitating my 20 year old cat hesitating to jump up on the couch. He used to just come running, woo, just launch right on. Then he would come up and kind of think about it. For one second, that one second hesitancy is enough for me to say, you know what? His joints are tender. I'm going to start him on joint support. I'm going to start him on a little CBD. I'm going to start him on pain management. Uh, my kitty yesterday was itching her right ear. And then she itched it again. And then about 30 minutes later, I she had licked her back paw. And then she put her foot in her ear. And then she was sniffing it and then checking it. And I was like, something's going on with her ear, right? So I went and looked in there. And she had a big old wad of gunk. I have a little outdoor courtyard that she goes in and she got some kind of debris in her ear, but her body told me that. And I was focused enough on her that I knew that she typically doesn't itch her ears. So then I knew to check her ears. So whatever your animal's doing that's new, you don't have to flip out about it, but it's enough to pay attention. So that's how we clue into what we should be focusing on. And how many pets do you have right now? I know at the height of things, I think it was 28 you mentioned know, in Forever Dog. I how know. many do you have right now? Two. Well, three total. Two kitties and a, a dog. But my dog that I co-share with my mama, my mama lives three doors down from me. When I, like this morning, Homer had to go to my mom's house because he'll come in during the podcast and he'll whine and whine and whine or bark or do what I call attention-seeking behavior. So right now I have three, but yes, in, in my heyday, and part of the reason is I travel a lot. And so it's just not fair when I was full-time in practice and never traveled. Then I was gone for 10 hours a day, but had a ton of animals at home. Now, after COVID, way less time in the exam room. In fact, I just do, I'm doing one quarter time consulting, one quarter time uh, visiting with, with my clients, and then the rest of the time writing, traveling, lecturing, doing other things. So because of my travel schedule, I don't have as many pets as I used to. It's not fair while I'm gone for two, three, four weeks. So you opened up there talking about being observant of our pets and noticing when things are different. How do we know when that goes from a level where we can manage something to including the vet? I think when your animals show discomfort or the symptom is progressing. So if you can tell that your something is bugging your animal, it should bug you. If there's a symptom that is progressive, like one day your animal uh, retches, Okay, whatever. Maybe had hair in the back of the throat. Day two, they're and then maybe coughs up a little bile foam. Okay, still eating, drinking, pooping fine, all is well. 
Day three or four, your animal starts to not want to eat well and maybe is drinking more water. That's enough for me as a vet to be like, I'm going to check this out. Something's going on. So if you see progressive symptoms or your animal is in discomfort in any way, shape, or form, time to call the doctor. And what about for the healthy animals out there? Somebody that just wants to maintain contact with the vet over a period of time, how often would you recommend checking in with the vet, getting a wellness checkup? Yeah. And what specific tests should we have done to keep that baseline knowing where our pet's health is at on a regular basis? So it's such a good question. I am a proactive wellness veterinarian. So I will see my patients when they're sick, which is crushing to me. I much prefer to see my patients when they're well, when they're healthy. And when I explained this about 20 years ago, when I intentionally set up the very first proactive wellness clinic, I had some colleagues saying, you're not going to, you're going to go broke. No one's going to come and see you. Like, why would they come see you when their pets are well? Because I want to partner with my clients to prevent the body from breaking, to prevent degenerative disease from occurring. And because dogs and cats are aging exponentially, they age fast. You know, their lifespan at most, we hope to get 20, but we may not. You and I go to 80. So literally they're, we're, they're aging four times faster than humans. So I like to see my puppies and kittens every six months. And then when they turn one and two, I, every six month uh, is still wellness exams. But what happens during those wellness exams is initially we focus on making sure the spine is aligned, making sure that when growth plates fuse, that everything is structurally aligned, make sure that diet scored away. We want to work on the microbiome, make sure that puppies and kittens are parasite free in terms of GI and microbiome resiliency. Then we move on to training, making sure that, you know, they're not doing any destructive behaviors with their neck and collars or pulling. That's that first year of life where we're getting training squared away. They're starting to learn some English. You're making sure that you're encompassing a detoxified, clean home. You're hitting a diet. You're making sure that we're building a strong microbiome. That's year one. Then year two, so during that year, they become teenagers. And then at between one and two, they actually become adult status. Once they're adults, then we work on building muscle tone, making sure that tendons and muscles and ligaments are strong because no one wants a, a, an ACL when they're three or four. We work on making sure that the animals are staying in good communication with mom and dad in terms of ongoing training. Oftentimes that first year training is enough to carry animals through, but I've had some strong independent thinking dogs that have to stay in class all of year two, because every single time I drop out of, of, of a fear-free training class, they're like, I'm going to run the show. I decided that I don't know how to sit, stay, or down. I decided I'm going to be reactive to another dog. And I'm like, oh no. So then we just stay in class. My rule of thumb is you stay in class until your dog makes you proud, like proud. You're like, yeah, like good behavior. So some dogs are, you know, get it right away. And they're like, I'm a rule follower and I'll listen to mom. Some dogs are like, Phew. So we just stay in class. That year two, we're building musculoskeletal health. We're starting to think about the fact that we live in a dirty world. So the earth is full of chemicals and residues and contaminants. So we're thinking about, okay, you know, what are you filtering your water? You know, are you spraying your yard? What's your dog's exposure to some of those environmental chemicals? And then what are we going to do? We all live in a toxic world. So it's, you can't put your baby in a bubble. So what are we going to do for detoxification? What are we going to do in terms of like maybe wiping down paws? Maybe after, you know, if you live in a condo where they're going to spray the grass and your dog is going to have pesticide, herbicide contamination, how are we going to rinse those paws off? We set up that like year two, three, and then probably the hardest thing, one of the hardest things I heard from one of the longevity scientists when I was interviewing them for, for the forever dog was that dogs start cellular aging between two and three. And it's like, ah, oh, man. But it's a little bit like us in our 20s. You know, now research shows that as humans stop producing growth hormone, our early 20s, that that aging process is going. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we don't feel like we feel like, you know, in my 20s, I felt invincible. But it's during the 20, 30s, and 40s that we can, as humans, lay the groundwork for building really strong, resilient bodies that then carry us. That is when we build our bank of minerals as women in our skeletal system so we don't get osteoporosis 40 years later. So the same thing is true with dogs. When this cellular aging is coming about, if my patients aren't, uh, aren't on organic fresh food, then we're like, okay, what can we do to start 
incorporating things that we know will help the body age better, like cellular health, cellular detoxification, glutathione, doing some things that could help the body with their natural and endogenous antioxidant support. We start that between two and three. Then midlife comes four to six, seven, eight. Then we talk about, okay, Wear and tear starts to happen. Animals have personality and habits just like you and I do. They can bear more weight on one leg than another. They can end up being, you know, a lot of dogs, whatever, whatever their life says, they want to dig. So then they get some front end stiffness going. Then we start addressing the specific issues around that midlife period that are specific to that dog or cat. Then they move into senior. And as seniors, we proactively start a senior protocol to prevent cartilage from degenerating. We also have to look at genetics behavior and then what the dog's background was. So if you rescue a dog that spent his whole life in a a laboratory, or in my situation, I rescued a dog that's literally spent his whole life in an eight by 10 room with a, with an old man that lived in a nursing home his entire life. And the dog lived in the nursing home and the dog never left the nursing home eight by 10 room. When I got homie, he, his, he couldn't even walk around the block. He was so weak. And his body was just not used to any exercise. So I had to slowly begin conditioning his body. So we take each one of those circumstances into individual account, and then we create a protocol around it. But I think the, and then from seniors, we go to geriatric. But through each of these stages, Jesse, the body's dynamic and aging is dynamic and health is dynamic. So it's not like you start a protocol when your puppy or kitten is one, and then that's what you keep them on forever and ever. You are meeting with your veterinarian every six months to proactively think ahead like, okay, I'm going to be moving from a house with a big backyard and working a full-time job to a tiny apartment where I get to maybe work part-time. What does that mean for exercise? What does that mean for environmental enrichment for your dog or cat? What does it mean in terms of flights of stairs? What does it mean for time spent? Like we start factoring these in. What I found is waiting a year in between these appointments especially the second half of an animal's life is so many degenerative changes. So many life changes happen with my clients and so many degenerative changes would happen with my patients that waiting a year in between wellness exams is waiting too long. So I'm a big believer in meeting with your veterinarian, proactive wellness vet that's going to measure the muscle bundles in your dog's back legs and be like, you know what? You're not going to believe this, but at six, your dog's muscle quad bundle has shrunk a quarter of an inch. You can't see it. They're fluffy. You wouldn't know it. But that's when we start saying, okay, what are we going to do to build rear end endurance? I don't want that German shepherd's butt to go down when he's nine, right? What are we going to do to build up the back half of the body? But those are all conversations you have with the wellness veterinarian every six months, in my opinion. That was a long answer. (laughs) No, but it was very thorough. It gave us a lot of areas that we can dive into throughout our conversation you mentioned wellness vet there a couple of times. Obviously, you're a wellness vet and this is what you do. But how does somebody go about finding somebody? I mean, they might not be as quote unquote extreme as you, but how do they find somebody that gets it and they're on the same page like we're going to be talking about today? So in the human realm, these are called functional medicine doctors, which means we start with lifestyle related issues, which account for about the certainly infectious disease incurs in dogs and cats. I'm not saying that trauma and infectious disease don't occur, but what the entire functional medical community, both human and animal has recognized is that infectious diseases, COVID's a great example, front and center. It's very real. However, when it comes to the dog cat space, our animals are much more likely to die of organ failure, degenerative disease, autoimmune disease, cancer, organ failure, or musculoskeletal systems wearing out, non-infectious diseases than they would ever die of something that they would catch or be contagious, or we would need to manage in terms of being uh, something that they caught. So lifestyle-related diseases have to be managed with lifestyle management. And that's an area of proactive medicine that I believe the human medical system and the veterinary system, when I say have failed us, vet schools and medical schools are not set up to teach students how to create wellness. They're set up to treat disease. And until the medical paradigm shifts where we are taught in veterinary schools how to prevent disease from occurring, you're going to have to look a little harder than just the yellow pages or Googling or asking your neighbor, hey, who's your vet? And do you like him or her? That's a great place to start. I do recommend that you like all the doctors on your healthcare team. But beyond that, 
you need to make sure that your own viewpoints about health and wellness align with your doctors. So if you have a human doctor that you go to and you're like, hey, you know, I'm interested in living longer. I'm interested in doing some blood work to make sure that um, beyond the typical CBC and chemistry, I'm interested in maybe measuring my C-reactive protein. I'm interested in measuring my internal antioxidant status. I'm interested in doing some inflammatory markers, some of these extra tests. If you get kind of a glazed over look from your human medical doctor, that's like, ooh, that is not in my wheelhouse. No problem. Then you go find a doctor that is like, oh, of course, good for you. You don't want to break and I can help you not break. You don't kick your G, your GP out of the picture. You just partner with additional doctors that can help you meet your needs. That is also true with veterinary medicine. So in veterinary medicine, you may have an ER clinic. If God forbid you need it in the middle of the night because your vet isn't open, cool. You may have, you know, your parents, parents, parents may have been going to Dr. Johnson around the corner everyone's whole life. And so in turn, you bring your dog or cat to Dr. Johnson because they're family friends and you've known them forever. Awesome. If Dr. Johnson isn't a proactive wellness doctor, or when you say, Hey, Dr. Johnson, I've heard that, you know, these core vaccines don't wear out. I've heard that they actually have lifetime immunity that my pets don't have to be vaccinated every year. I want to do a tighter. If Dr. Johnson's like, what? What's a tighter? You don't kick Dr. Johnson to the curb. You just find a proactive wellness doctor that will help you. And so in my situation, There's a lot of proactive wellness veterinarians, which I'm thankful for, but not one on every corner. It's an absolutely growing body of a community of veterinarians who usually first become frustrated with their lack of training, recognize they want more, they go and get more training, they begin switching their practice to a proactive wellness model, and then they're able to see sick and disease cases, but also have the conversation about preventing disease from occurring. You can go to a website, CIBT edu.org. That's the, um, that's the integrative medical, the college of integrative veterinary therapies. And that's a college that provides additional training for veterinarians and as well as a directory and a whole bunch of courses. They're starting to offer courses for groomers, for shelter workers, for pet parents, for, for people who, for, for dog lovers, for people that are really into making a difference and they want to learn more, the College of Integrative Veterinary Therapies has this whole robust online teaching platform and program for both veterinarians and pet parents, as well as paraprofessionals that can be a good resource because you can partner with a proactive medical doctor that is maybe not even in your state but telemedicine, just as we do oftentimes for our own well-being, we end up using telemedicine, the beauties of advanced technology to be able to help our animals live longer. If you can't find someone in your own community to partner with, there are plenty of veterinarians worldwide who would be happy to help you via telemedicine. Thank goodness. And I think one of the big challenges, and this also falls into the human realm as well, is having knowledge like we're talking about today or you talk about in your book permeate through and shatter the current paradigm. Because for a lot of people, they're just going to follow. You mentioned like going to your neighbor and what vet do you use? Like people might not know, likely won't know for their health or their pet's health that there is another way. So I think part of the importance of a conversation like this or your book and all the education you're putting out there is to let people know there is another way with these things. And you need to, unfortunately at this point, do a lot of our own research to learn to even understand what we're looking for in a vet or a doctor for if, you know, if we're a person looking for yeah. care. I couldn't agree more. And I also think that you don't know what you don't know. But that is the reason we wrote the book is that what ultimately happens in that situation is you end up with regret. And regret is, I believe, one of the most horrible emotions, feelings, because the statement that we hear is, you know, if I would have known, I would have, I would have made different decisions. I would have gone a different path. I just didn't know. So step number one, Jesse, absolutely, is to know enough that you feel at least a little comfortable, maybe not confident, but a little bit comfortable having a broader conversation with your veterinarian. If you don't know what questions to ask, then you could be not asking the right questions. So second thing though is when you when you meet people. We have that intuition. We have a natural gut feeling about, okay, I'm aligning with this person or I resonate with this person or you don't. And I would also say use that, Jesse, that when you meet a veterinarian, the conversation might go something like this. Hey, Dr. Johnson, I'm learning a lot and you helped me with my last, it was spot my last dog and he had degenerative joint disease and liver failure and cancer. And I can't 
bear to do that again. So I'm going to try and do things different with this next dog. And I would like to partner with you during this journey because I need you on my healthcare team and I want you to help guide me, but I want to be the best guardian and leader for my dog's health and well-being as possible. And so I'm going to potentially feed foods that you don't sell at your clinic. And I'm going to ask for different tests and different potential treatments like vaccine titers. And I was wondering if you, I understand that you may not understand it or agree with it, but I was wondering if you would be my veterinarian anyway, because I need you on my healthcare team and we don't have to agree on everything, but I get to run the show and I want you to be my vet. If your vet says no, I get to run the show, then I probably would find a different veterinarian. But hopefully your veterinarian says, yes, of course. And I'm interested in learning and partnering with you. And we're going to see how this goes. That That's hopefully the response. But I think interviewing veterinarians to find the right one so that you feel comfortable along the way, the worst cop-out and a not good excuse is, I don't like my vet, so I just didn't go. Not okay. Because guess who loses in that situation? Your animal. Your animal is in the palm of your hand and we control everything. That's both terrifying and incredibly empowering. I would hope that we don't use, "Ah, I don't have any vets. I I live in North Dakota and having good vets, I'm just not going to go or I'm not going to learn or it's my vet's responsibility to know that stuff. Why didn't my vet tell me that kidney failure is so common in cats? Like, why didn't my vet tell me? Well, Vets are busy and maybe you didn't ask and maybe you didn't know you should ask. So we need to begin owning our own educational level, especially if it's our goal to create the healthiest animals we can. We need to own our share of the knowledge base and not abdicate that that responsibility to anyone else. It is ours and ours alone to know enough to make good decisions as pet owners, not as vets, as pet owners. We have to know enough to make the best decisions. And if we don't feel confident in that, just keep learning, right? Just keep educating yourself. You're touching on something really important I want to highlight. The fact that there is this relationship with our pets and the only other example I can really think of is with our young kids. Mm -hmm. When as guardians, we have this extra layer of responsibility because kids and pets, they can't speak up for themselves. And we need to, as parents, you know, consider that and take that responsibility that we don't have when it comes to just our own health. Somebody might, you know, realize that they're smoking or eating fast food all the time or doing all these things to their own body and that it's not healthy, but that's your own body. Those are the choices you're making. With a pet, unfortunately, Or fortunately, you know, depending on how the decisions we make, we're making those decisions. So we have that extra layer of responsibility. And it's a heavy one, Jesse. It's it's a lot, especially with a different species. I mean, that requires us to be empathetic about the fact that dogs are still very much dogs. They're not little people. They're and cats are not little dogs. They're they're you own their own unique being with their own set of genetic predispositions with their own personality that they were born with, but also then their PTSD from their life experiences. It's hard to get through life without trauma. We're all going to have it. Some animals, some mammals have a lot more trauma than others, physical trauma, emotional trauma. We all have stuff. And so recognizing what our animal's stuff is, being empathetic and sensitive to their stuff and recognizing that the only help that they can get comes through us. It's that's a heavy responsibility and one that I don't think we should take lightly, both for parenting two-legged kids and four-legged kids. And there's good news in this, which is the fact that a lot of these things we're going to learn and apply to our pets fits into our own paradigm for health as well. And you have a saying that health can go up the leash. So if we're taking proper care of our pets and learning and educating naturally, we're going to upgrade our health if we're doing a good job with the pets. You are spot on. And I think a lot of times humans, we're not kind to ourselves. I have so many clients that take far better care of their dogs and cats than they do of their own bodies. They love their dogs and cats far more than they love themselves. But when they see 
the results of their excellent choices play out in their dogs and cats' lives when they see that they switch foods. They go from an ultra process, a highly refined ultra process feed grade kibble to a fresh human grade, nutrient rich, omega DHA packed diet. And the itching goes down and the hair comes in lusher and softer and the hot spots go away and the shedding is minimized. People are like, oh my gosh. Two things. First of all, I did this. Like I like I changed my animal's diet and look at the improvement in their quality of life. And number two, I wonder if that would work for me. I wonder if I started increasing my amount of DHA and EPA, would my brain work better? Would I have less inflammation? Would my skin and coat be better? <laughs> you know, would I would I have less flaking and itching? All those things. And then people do that and then their quality of life is improved. So sometimes my clients that are the most awful to themselves, if I if I can once they see it play out in their animals' lives, they and you can encourage them to take those same, the same proactive lifestyle changes for themselves, their own quality of life improves and increases. And in turn, for me, as the as one of the doctors on the healthcare team, that animal is going to have a better mama or dad because the human's healthier. The healthier the human, the longer they're going to be on the planet, the more balanced they're going to be cognitively, the better decisions they're going to make the clearer their brain is going to be, the more they're going to be tuned into their animal because they themselves are in the process of becoming healthy. It's a really important point. Well, there's a lot of different areas we can hit on and go into the nuances and you've brought a lot of them up already in our conversation. I think the first one that we should really open up and dig into is something we went into depth on our last conversation. So I just want to do a more zoomed out overlook on this, which is diet. We actually went over an hour and a half talking about diet and supplements. And we're going to link to that in this conversation. But let's talk again from that broad understanding. You've talked about fresh food and kibble. Let's talk about what the spectrum is and why it's so important that we consider, not consider, that we upgrade when possible the food choices for our dogs. So the 10,000 foot statement, the one liner Jesse would be feed the best food you can afford to feed. But that comes with a caveat is you got to know what the best food is, right? So just like when you're nourishing your two-legged kids, you want to feed the, the most minimally processed, which means you have the choice between junk food, like ultra processed junk food, snack food that you could feed your kid to what's in the fridge. There's that spectrum between highly processed, processed, minimally processed and fresh. There's this spectrum. Our goals for our whole entire family, the entire family, furred, feathered, winged, skin, whatever, is that those are our food choices, ultra processed to unprocessed. We want to lean on this side and kind of avoid the ultra processed spectrum. Same is true for pets. The downside is about 85% of pets around the world get 100% of their calories every day from the ultra process part of the scale, which means they are primarily trying to sustain life and achieve health, which I don't want to say is impossible, but it's a little bit like achieving health, eating as a human, a highly refined diet. All you eat your whole life is refined food. You may achieve health, but you would achieve better health if you address diet. And that is true with mammals across the board. That's just a fact of life that fresher, the fresher and the healthier, the less processed your food is, the more nutrients they contain and the less byproducts or icky, yucky nasties that come along for the ride, which is what happens when you high heat process foods or when they're stored for a long time or when they have to have a ton of preservatives. So the lack of nutrients and the processing creates foods that become less healthy down this side of the spectrum. So the 10,000 foot view would be try and feed this half of the spectrum. You've probably heard the, the old cliche, shop the outside of the grocery store, shop the fresher section. That same principle holds true for pets. What we have to do then is be able to fit it into the family budget. And there's ways you can do that. So you have ultra processed extruded kibble. And then next down on the list would be gently baked, which means instead of baked at you know 460 degrees, it might be baked at 350. Then you have what's called air dried, which is basically dehydration with some heat. And then you have dehydrated. And even in the dehydrated category, it ranges from air, like 
room temperature dehydrated up to 250. Then you have freeze dried, which is actually vacuum packed under freezing temperatures. And then there's gently cooked foods. And then there's frozen raw foods on that spectrum. And I would tell my clients, feed as much of the less processed food as you can afford to feed. Now, here's what's interesting, Jesse. Some of these ultra processed foods are two to three times the cost of healthier foods. So the other thing you have to take into consideration is do your homework when it comes to what category of fresher food you're looking at, because some of the gently baked or air dried foods are way more expensive than feeding an entirely unprocessed diet. So it is important to do your homework. What I say to my clients is, do you have more time or money? If you have more money, buy organic free range, frozen, nutritionally complete food for your dog or cat. It's amazing. If that is too expensive for you, then make it which means you have to have time to prep food prep for your dog or cat for a month. And that's what I do. I just set aside a Saturday. I make a ton of food, freeze it, and then I'm done for the month. And that's how I nourish my animals. It's I'm a busy person, but I believe in the power of food. And I love knowing when I make my dog and cat food, I pick the meat, I pick the veggies. I know what supplements I'm using to balance the food. I make it so I know what's in it. And that's very satisfying for me. For somebody who's on the fence right now and they're kind of like, okay, I get this, but you know, I'm busy and I'm buying food at the pet store and it seems good. I think we need to go into what is in that ultra processed food. So let's go to that other end of the spectrum. We have the raw, you know, organic food over here. Let's talk about what standards they have for that ultra processed food and what is actually being fed to the dog if we go that route. Well, there are two issues in the pet food industry, two big issues that I think it's important for every pet parent to understand. Number one, there's food grade and feed grade, which is how food is classified. So USDA inspectors stand either slaughterhouses or granaries. You know, everything that goes into the human food chain has been inspected. That's a blessing of being able to live in a country that is modernized and has food control officials in terms of USDA inspectors. I'm very happy that our food chain is evaluated and monitored as humans. Everything that fails inspection, Jesse, goes into pet food or animal feed. We feed it to pigs, cows, chickens. Everything that is not okay for humans to eat gets recycled to feed. So food is a term deemed for humans. Pet feed is for animals. Somehow, somehow 40 years ago, the pet food industry got the term pet food approved for dog and cat food labels, but it is the biggest misnomer in the world. It is act- Unless it's made with human grade ingredients, which is less than 1% of pet food, it's, a- it's not food, it's feed. It has been rejected by USDA inspectors. So that's quality control issue number one, is what are the raw materials going into pet food? I'm going to leave it there. If you want to dive into the nitty gritty of Well, what do you mean rejected? Are we talking mycotoxin-filled grains? Yeah. Are we talking snouts, beaks, uh, sweeping the slaughterhouse floors, hides, beaks, ears, tails, hooves? Yes. That's all protein that humans don't eat that gets cut off animals when slaughtered, and that is what we're feeding to pets. We can keep going. I am a USDA licensed meat inspector. I can certainly keep going. But the premise is from that 10,000-foot view, buying human-grade food is what people think they're feeding their animals, and they are not, unless it's labeled human grade, which as I mentioned, it's super rare. Susan Thixton has an amazing, it's called The List. Susan Thixton is a pet food advocate and really advocates for pet parents in terms of being able to have good choices in pet food. The truth about pet food is her website, and she produces this amazing list that helps people make best choices for human-grade foods and goes through the companies and looks at quality control documents and verifies that it's human-grade. So that's a really good resource. If you're like, listen, I don't know if, I don't know what food to feed, go to Truth About Pet Food and get her list. It's easy and simple and will also point you in the right direction of approved human-grade foods that are not lying about being human-grade. She triple checks it. So that's one option. The second issue within the pet food industry, beside the fact that it's made with all rendered ingredients that are not approved for human consumption, the second big issue is, is it biologically appropriate? Which means kitties being obligate carnivores and dogs being facultative carnivores or scavenging carnivores, they have a very high requirement for meat, for animal protein. And what we know is that they don't have a carbohydrate requirement. They don't need any corn, wheat, or rice, or rice, or potato, or tapioca. What are the other fillers in food? Now, lentil, peas, um, 
Some millet's now becoming a big one. There's all of these additional carb sources that are added to pet food to reduce the cost of that rendered meat that they are putting in pet food. So what we teach people in the Forever Dog book is to do a simple carb equation because in addition to the quality control issues, we have way too many carbohydrates. It would be better suited, honestly, for more of like a goat. Like the 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 amount of carbohydrates we're feeding to animals would be better aligned for more vegan animals. The problem is dogs and cats aren't vegan. So when you carb load a species that doesn't have a carb requirement, you end up with a lot of metabolic stress in their bodies, weight gain, predisposition to diabetes and organ diseases, cardiovascular disease, cancer are the big ones. Not to mention all of those foods can be very reactive to an animal system. So you've got the allergy issues and massive gut issues. When I say gut issues, like the number one reason dogs and cats go to the vet is GI issues, vomiting, diarrhea, intermittent stool problems, constipation, all those gut issues. Certainly they can be treated or masked with a drug that your vet will give you, but probably the root cause of those GI issues in your pets is the food that you're feeding them and not some innate horrible disease that they have. We're putting something in every day that the body's reacting to and saying, I, I, I can't handle this. So rather than treat these symptoms that our, that our dog's bodies are giving us with a drug, taking a step back and looking at the root causes of why your animals have symptoms is really important. Veterinarians are trained to just prescribe medication to treat the symptom, but not address the root cause. And those root causes are fished out either by yourself, becoming knowledgeable enough to backtrack where your where things went wrong in your dog or cat's body, or with a, with the help of a functional medicine veterinarian who will say, "Hey, listen, if you've got chronic blowout, intermittent diarrhea, we have a food issue. So let's go down that path and figure out." What's wrong with the food? In addition, Jesse, then to pet foods being not approved for human consumption and biologically inappropriate, then when we process them to sit on a shelf for two years, there's a whole bunch of things that happen, grain mites, storage mites, oxidation, which means the fats go rancid. We have to put a ton of chemicals and preservatives in the food to keep the food shelf stable, especially, you know, you're sitting in a hot Houston warehouse for a year and a half. There's this party that can happen in the bag with mycotoxins and rancidity issues. All of those things are addressed with a massive chemical load that are added to the foods to stabilize the food so they are that so that they're safe, which means they don't kill your dog or cat when they eat them. So those are the big issues with ultra processed foods that also um, ultimately lead to early degenerative disease, especially if that's the only source of nutrition that dogs and cats are getting. If the only thing we're putting in these magnificent cartons to run is terrible fuel, halfway through life, oftentimes their bodies begin to break. And isn't there a certain umbrella of foods that only the vet carries, either a professional line or a vet line that you can't buy at the pet store? There are. They're called prescription diets or veterinary diets. And those That's are diets. That's what it is. Yeah. And so actually, Hill Science Diet owns the term prescription diet. So like if let's say that I wanted to start a line of veterinary diets, I can't use the term prescription diet because Hill Science Diet, that brand owns that term. But here's what's important to know. Those diets do not contain any medication. It sound, the term prescription diet makes it sound like there's something special in that food that makes it medicated. And there isn't. It's that those foods have been formulated to, in theory, address a specific issue. So there's food, there's heart disease foods, liver disease foods, cancer foods, GI foods, brain foods, what organs did we miss? Pancreatitis foods. There's literally a prescription diet for every system in the body. But we have to remember it's still ultra processed, made with feed grade contaminants with the same stabilization and high heat chemical changes that occur in the bag. It's still fast food. It's just rearranged in terms of having maybe less protein if your animal's in kidney failure. It has less um, 
carbohydrates by 10% if your animal has cancer. But remember, if you have a dog or cat with cancer and you're feeding a 60% starch sugar, which is what starch is, based diet, and you decide to put your dog on the new Onk diet, which is the prescription anti-cancer diet or cancer treatment diet that's being released right now, you go from 60% sugar to 30% sugar. Improvement? Yeah enough to really impact the body and provide utilizable raw materials to actually address disease? Probably not. All right. I think it's important we went into that. Yeah. So we've gone into the nutrition piece now. Again, this is an overview. People can go into our deep dive previously or lack thereof nutrition. Let's get into when to eat because this is in your book, you talk about how this might be even more important than what we're feeding the dog. And until your latest book, I didn't even think of this. And I'm somebody that's into intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating. And I'm somebody that before knowing this, I was guilty of giving my dog goji treats like outside of her typical eating window. You know, it's you love your dog. They come in from their nighttime pee or poo and it's like, okay, you want to give them a piece of liver or something. And I've been more cognizant in doing that less now that I know better. But let's talk about the eating window and why that's something people need to consider. Well, it's really wonderful that you already are doing intermittent fasting because when I have these conversations with, with people that have no idea about this vast body of scientific research proving beyond the shadow of a doubt, like it's not even arguable. Five years ago, people were like, mm, I don't know about this on the human side. Every single metabolic specialist, wellness specialist, longevity specialist, geneticist, we talked to every single one of them said, it's kind of, you don't have to like it, but you can't argue the research is so strong on so many different species that it, most of us don't like to hear that creating an eating window for our pets would allow them to be metabolically healthier. Because what it feels like what we're saying is you're going to deny your animal and that doesn't feel good. And that if somehow your animal is not going to get what they need, and that doesn't feel good, especially in the U.S. when food equals love, and especially when we're all overworked, we're super tired, we, we oftentimes use food as an emotional substitute for appropriate bonding time, really connecting with your dog. Doing a 30-minute walk outside is uh, maybe outside of you know, too much today, so we tend to reward with food instead. So we'll swap a cardio walk for a snack instead. That in our brains, humans do interesting things with food and our relationship, our human relationship with food plays into our ability to understand our relationship with food in terms of how we're nourishing our dog or cat. For the purposes of this conversation in light of we only have an hour and a half, I'm just going to hold my conversation to dogs right now. Kitties have a little bit different physiology and we don't fast kitties like we potentially would fast a dog. But that being said, we still can create eating windows for both species. And what do we mean by that? When I interviewed Dr. Sachin Panda, who won the uh, the Nobel Prize uh, for circadian rhythm work, I believe in 2017, I went to Sock Institute and he said, he was the man that said to me, when you feed your dog is as important as what you feed him. And, and as, a, as a veterinarian really into food, I'm like, ah, that's a little too much. I mean, I I have I had a problem with that statement. But he showed the clinical work on mice, not dogs, on mice to say, Karen, this is across mammalian physiology, and and he is definitely more of a scientist than me. I'm not going to argue with a man who won the Nobel Prize on this. But basically what he explained to me was that the body can only digest or fix itself. The body can't work on autophagy, which is cell cleanup and organ restoration and immune system building and doing everything it needs to do to keep the body from deteriorating. That's, that's what the body does when it's not eating. And then the second food comes in, the body stops the healing process, the reparative process, and then digests food. So he said, you tell me, Karen, do you want, do you, how long do you want to push the hold button on immune repair and cellular repair and autophagy. He said, because if you wake up in the morning and even worse, so you leave the food bowl down 24 seven, where animals just go to the all you can eat buffet and have snacks 24 seven, that is the definition of heaven, right? Like literally, but that is not reality for any mammal on the planet. It's just not, except 
horses. So ruminating animals and vegan animals that have to eat to maintain digestion, they are the one exception, exception where they literally have to nibble all the time. But out of all of the mammals on earth, unless you are a ruminant, a horse or a cow or a goat or a sheep, until, unless you are that animal that needs to be eating a little bit all the time to keep peristalsis going all the time or your GI tract shuts down, most mammals, aside from those unique species, they do well not eating all the time. And certainly dogs were designed like humans to fit fast and then feast. So dogs co-evolved with humans for the last 50,000 years, 30,000 years. Well, and some scientists will say 20,000 years. The argument, when did wolves become dogs? It's a hotly debated thing. But the fact is sometimes like 30,000 years, wolves did become dogs alongside humans recognizing, hey, you're cool. I'm going to throw you my table scraps and then we're going to go hunting together and whatever I don't eat, I'll share with you. And the dog wolf was like, all right, this is a good deal because this, you know, I, first of all, dogs are social species and humans are social species. And we already know how cool dogs are. So sometime over the last 30,000 years, this partnership started where humans hunted and shared leftover scraps and bones with their dogs. And their dogs were like, all right, I'm in on this deal. And then periods when they weren't hunting, they were resting. And a dog's physiology is very naturally attuned to this period of eating and then fasting. Sometime in the last hundred years, the human nutrition world convinced humans that we have to eat three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the veterinary world just kind of adopted that. You need to feed your dog at least twice a day to be a good mom or dad. And when that's challenged, Jesse, I have a lot of people who I call them casual pet parents. I kind of, in my brain, divide people's evolutionary path on how much they know about science and the latest research into casual pet parents, which means they might catch something on the news and maybe pick up a little, but they really have done no reading, no application, no study into any health or wellness topic. And then 2.0 pet parents which could engage in this conversation, no problem. So there's the spectrum of knowledge within pet ownership that goes from kind of lovingly clueless to really intelligent pet parents that put these practices into action. And it is such a notable difference when they come into the exam room. It's such a noticeable difference. So dogs were designed to eat a meal and then fast. And dogs that are given that opportunity, historically, not only do they live longer, they have less inflammation, less degenerative disease, less pancreatic stress, meaning less type 2 diabetes, less pancreatitis, less liver inflammation, less GI symptoms, less inflammatory conditions pertaining to oral inflammation, skin inflammation, GI, gastritis, colitis, enteritis, like the entire body functions better when food is provided during a window, six to eight hours. And it, some, of, some of my clients say, listen, my dog really likes to eat. Then you're fine in doing three or four little meals in that eight hours. If you want to give your dog snacks, you know, seven times within that eight hours, great. But it doesn't matter if you set that eating window first thing in the morning or like you fast your dog. And so you get up in the morning, you have a crazy morning, you go to work and then you come home and then you both start eating and you eat, you know, it doesn't matter when you set it. Dr. Patchen said, Dr. Sachin Panda said, but you got to set it and kind of hold to it. So when it comes to going pee in the middle of the night, when they come in, that is when you're like, all right, good boy. Just, you know, head, just, you know, a big love kiss session or a chicken broth ice cube. That's my go-to treat in my house. I do a lot of bone broth ice cubes to where I'm just used to giving something. So I give everything in my house gets a lot of bone broth ice cubes because it's like basically a caloric. They get to crunch it and they think it's something amazing, but it does not rock. It doesn't create circadian rhythm trauma. And that's a great way to reward a potty break outside of your eating window. But this concept, Jesse, every single time you introduce that your listeners are going to be like, did she just say fast my dog? What's important to remember is that fasting means your dog's getting all the same calories. You're not dieting them per se. You're not cutting them back. You're not restricting them. Certainly their water is available, purified, filtered water, 24 seven, always. You're just cramming all their calories that you would normally be letting them eat in 24 hours. You're cramming the calorie intake down to six to eight hours so that the rest of that day is spent fixing their bodies, cleaning up their bodies, 
detoxifying their bodies. The rest of that time, their body is using that time to anti-age, to age backwards, to, to, to help the body clean up. And so just beginning to think differently about that term intermittent fasting for pets is a good first step. It makes sense. And again, I'm somebody who's known about this. And even years ago, when I was just dipping my toe into the water, starting to intermittent fast for myself, I never thought about it for the dog until you brought it up. So I think it's yeah. important that we get the word out there and, and get into the details. It's good. So let's move into something you've touched on a couple times out of the food realm. You mentioned titers and vaccines. This is a whole topic I think it's important we dive into. So let's open it up talking about vaccines. Which ones do you recommend? Are there certain ones that we can consider and we don't necessarily need to get? And then we'll go deeper into the titers and how that works. So vaccines are given to mammals to prevent infectious disease, obviously. And so the same premise, the same physiologic action happens in the body with all mammals. If they get an, a, a vaccine, the goal is to immunize the patient, which means you inject in a modified live vaccine. So you take a live virus, you modify it. So it stimulates the immune system, but it doesn't create disease. You inject it into a mammal and then the mammal's body says, oh, what's this? I will make an antibody to it. And so I can address it. And then the body builds up antibodies. And the beautiful part about antibodies against infectious diseases is that our bodies are magnificently made. Same with our dogs and cats. The body doesn't forget a foreign invader very often, especially a viral foreign invader. The body builds up antibodies and there, that circulating antibody level initially is quite high. And then if the body doesn't see that virus again, antibody titers can begin dropping, but they can drop really low. In fact, they can drop to undetectable levels, but that doesn't mean that the body has forgotten. There's still cells circulating at a very low level that are called memory cells or an anamnistic response, which means when the immune system is then prompted again, or this viral invader comes in, these few memory cells are like, wait, I remember this guy. We're going to ramp up more antibody production. So the body doesn't forget viral infections often. And that's a blessing to all of us as mammals, because when we encounter it again, our body knows what to do. That's the premise of why we give, I'm just going to talk about dogs right now, Parvo distemper adenovirus, which are these three core vaccines that we provide to animals, hoping that they have an immunologic response and build up antibodies. That's why we do it. When we vaccinate puppies, it's really important, Jesse, because when, when puppies are born and they nurse from mama, they get colostrum. And colostrum is that first immune system that kind of protects them and shields them from all these deleterious outdoor viruses that could kill them. Mama's colostrum protects their immune system beautifully, but somewhere between five and 10 weeks of age, their colostrum levels start to drop and then their natural immune system takes off. But there's this window of opportunity in between maternal protection, maternal antibody dropping, and their own immune system picking up. There's this window where dogs are wide open for these viral infections. It will kill them dead if they get them. And so the whole reason we vaccinate is for this narrow window during puppyhood. When puppies are exposed, their immune systems are naive and they will die if they encounter these viruses. That's why we do it. So hopefully some of your readers are like, or listeners are like, well, how do you know when that is? Such a good question. Because if you vaccinate a puppy when they still have maternal antibody, they don't make any, they don't, they don't respond to the vaccine. They do not become immunized, which means in the human brain, you're like, okay, I took my puppy in, got that first shot. After the second shot, I know he takes two shots to get the immune system really going. I got the first one. I'm halfway done. Not if your dog or your puppy still has maternal antibody. It, that first vaccine didn't do anything. So I'm a big believer. If you have a rescue litter, or if you're working with a breeder, well-qualified, functional, intelligent breeders all do an easy, simple blood test on the mama, the mama of the litter of the puppies. Or if you're if you're doing foster care and you're working with the Humane Society, we do a lot of 
of these nomographs on foster moms or, you know, mamas that are in the shelter system, you can draw blood of the mama dog and you, we can predict with incredible accuracy the day that maternal antibody drops off. It's called a nomograph and they're easily done. And it's a blood test. You send it to University of Madison Vet School and it will tell you the day that the maternal antibody is gone. And then it's the next day or two or three that you would give that first vaccine. So that's really important. Vaccinating when a puppy is not going to be able to build antibodies is a vaccine that is, is uh, null and void. It's just, it just did nothing. So that's part of the reason that some animals go on to get people say, I vaccinated my puppy and then he got parvo. What happened? It's that the, the vaccine was not administered at the right time. After the second shot, we give puppies one vaccine and then two to four weeks later, we give them a second booster shot. And after that second shot, their immune system should start producing antibodies, which means that they are protected for parvo, distemper, and adenovirus for life for life. Just like when you and I went in, at least when I was a little kid, my mom hauled me in, gave me a measles, mumps, rubella. We don't go in every year for booster shots, me and you for measles, mumps, rubella, our, our kid shots. We got them when, when we were little guys and we're done. Why are we done? Because those memory cells are still in our bodies. And the same is true for dogs and cats. So it's a little bit confusing then to clients when they're like, well, wait, if you're telling me that all my puppy needs is two well-timed puppy shots and they're protected for life for core vaccines, parvo, decepar, and adeno. Why do I get a postcard in the mail every year that says, bring my two-year-old dog in, my three-year-old dog, my four-year-old dog? Like, why are we vaccinating until my dog dies? And it's a really good question. When I, when I kind of researched, when I dove into the research about 25 years ago on this topic, what I realized is that Vaccine protocols were set by veterinarians in the early 1900s based on recognizing that they did the very first vaccine immunology trial for one year, and it was a really expensive study, and they got to a year, and 100% of the dogs were protected, and they're like, all right, we're not going to keep finding out how long dogs can go. We win a year. The study's done. We'll just tell dog owners to come in every year and get boosters. So that was the rationale for annual vaccines was the study lasted a year. The dogs are protected. We'll just keep giving more vaccine. And I'm not opposed to that theory, except Jesse, more vaccines are not better. Giving your dog a vaccine over and over and over and over has been demonstrated to not be a benefit. Once a dog is immunized and protected, they're protected. So there's actually no such thing. That term booster shot isn't even true because there's nothing to boost. Either you are protected or your dog is not protected. It's a either or. You're not halfway protected. You're not a little protected. You are either protected or your dog is not protected. So boosting is irrelevant. You, there is no such thing as a booster and an already immunized dog. It's done. So how do you know if your dog's immunized? A titer. You can do a simple, easy blood test called a vaccine antibody titer test. Your vet will draw blood. You can either do it in-house. Your vet can buy a kit and do it right in-house, or you can send it to one of the, the two national labs. All labs in the U.S. do antibody titer testing. That's how you know if your dog is immunized. So here's my protocol. I do a nomograph, find out at six and a half weeks of age, this entire litter is going to be unprotected. Give the first vaccine at seven weeks. Come back in two to four weeks later, give the second shot. The antibody production, I think, is going to be great, but I'm not psychic, so how do I know? Two weeks after that second shot, I bring in a puppy, do a titer test. If that titer is protected, the puppy's protected for life, and you're done. You don't keep giving additional vaccines. So that's the ideal world. That's what I do in my practice. That's what functional medicine doctors do. That's what functional breeders are recommending. That's where the whole proactive wellness community is at. That is all of our, that's, it's not, this isn't my protocol. This is all what we do as a collective wellness community. So then the question is, well, what happens if that doesn't happen? What happens if we just keep giving poverty, semper, adeno, paraphernalia, and leptococcal and teller rabies? What if we just keep giving it the same dose for the two pound chihuahua as the 200 pound mastiff, all dog gets the exact same dose of vaccine. What happens then? Well, here's the dark side of vaccines. Yeah. Initially we know two will provide protection for life. Vaccines contain an adjuvant, which is a solution 
that makes the immune system respond. It's hard to trick the immune system. So I mentioned to you that we take a virus and we modify it. Unless we added an adjuvant into that modified virus, the immune system's like, ah, that's a dead virus. That's it. That's it. Virus incapable of replicating. I'm not going to make antibodies to that. The immune system's really smart. So we have to stimulate the immune system. We have to provoke the immune system to make antibodies. And how we provoke, how we poke an immune system is in addition to modifying this virus, we connect it to a metal, usually mercury, thimerosal, or aluminum. And when we inject then this modified virus with an adjuvant, a metal adjuvant, when we when we inject that into the body, the immune system's like, oh, I'm going to do my job and make some antibodies. So two doses of a heavy metal, I, I just don't see issues. It's okay. The body's resilient. We all are collecting metals. No problem. It's when we give metal injections, adjuvant injections year after year after year unnecessarily, that's where Jesse, the immune system can sometimes start to have a little bit of a meltdown response with being injected over and over and over with an immune stimulant that's unnecessary. And that can lead to cancer or autoimmune disease. So when people say, well, what's the downside of just giving vaccines every year? The downside is it can contribute to immune dysregulation because the body doesn't need to be stimulated over, the immune system doesn't need to be hyper-stimulated unnecessarily. And that's what we're doing by unnecessarily vaccinating animals. Now, I have been called an anti-vaxxer. So let's just clarify really quickly that anti-vaxxers means that you believe nothing should be vaccinated. And if you get if your dog gets parvo, parvo and dies, then oh well, that's one option. You know, then there are wise vaxxers. And that's what I am, which is I don't want any animals to die of anything, but I also don't want to kill my patients from over vaccinating. So wise vaxxers believe in providing what we call protective immunity, Jesse, but then titering. And if our patients are protected, we stop. So wise vaccination is what I'm going to recommend for everyone listening. You don't, you're not going to wantonly and blindly vaccinate your dog every year till they die. That's just literally overkill that can kill. But you also don't want your dog unprotected against infectious disease. And how you know is a tighter test. So much great information there. And I thought it was somebody who was tuned into this, and I'm learning a lot too. The way I understood it before was if you got your puppy vaccinated – you could get titers done periodically to see if you still had the antibodies. And if they don't at that time, you would want to revaccinate. So, so where so, I'm so, learning new info here, I want yeah. just give me one sec, is the fact that there's these memory cells and you actually might show on your titer test that you don't have immunity, but because you were vaccinated, if it was done in that right frame when the puppy was old enough, mm -hmm. that you actually have the immunity. So I'm learning quite a bit here. Okay, so now we're going to go to 3.0 pet point pet, pet parent conversation because you're there. And some of your listeners, it, listen, if if you're listening and and I lose you here, don't panic. Just listen to it again until it makes sense. But Jesse, you're ready to have this conversation. The whole reason that we tighter puppies two weeks after the last vaccine is for this reason. That's the most objective time to determine was there an immune system reaction or was there not? And Jesse, about there's don't quote me on this. I'm going to say it's like five percent. I think it. I think it's five percent. Dr. Ron Schultz, uh, immunologist at, at Madison Vet School, was the man that discovered this. There is a, a, a small category of dogs that are called non-responders, which means you can give them all the vaccines in the world and they just never produce antibodies. And these non-responding dogs, if you titer a puppy two weeks after that last shot and they don't have any antibodies, they're a non-responding dog. And no matter how, you can give a thousand and they're never going to make antibodies. So that's important to know, number one. So titers do two important things. They identify the very rare category of a non-responding dog, but they also demonstrate if your dog, if your puppy is protected at, let's just say you titer at 16 weeks and they're protected, they are protected for life. Now, here's the 3.0 conversation. There are several different types of titer tests. One is literally measuring antibodies, but he, and it's fine to do, but when you literally count 
antibodies. You remember how I mentioned um, that antibody levels are high, and if the body doesn't see those titers, it starts dropping, your antibody levels start dropping, kind of like us with COVID. If you got COVID and you do a COVID titer test, which you can, a COVID antibody test, your antibodies to COVID are going to be high. But if your body, if your immune system doesn't see COVID for this year, and then you titer next year, your COVID antibodies are going to be lower because your immune system doesn't need to keep a really high circulating and level of antibodies because the virus hasn't been entered into our system. Same is true with dogs. So here's the kicker. I'm not a huge fan of counting antibodies because my clients, so I'm a huge advocate of every single blood test you ever do on your dog, you ask for a copy. So in my practice, I automatically email. When I get a test result in, I email the actual test to my client so that they can keep a record of all of their pet's documents in their possession. My clients will start laying out year one titers, year two, year three, and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing the levels dropping. And then they can kind of start freaking out and then they become obsessed with, they assume that a high titer means a high protection and that a low titer means low protection. And that just isn't true. So rather than stress my blessed clients out, I do a type of titer test called an immunofluorescent antibody, IFA. And the reason I love IFA titer testing is, Jesse, it's a yes or no answer. They take a, a, a sample of your dog's blood. They challenge it with a, with a mixture that includes a live virus antigen that basically so you, you take the virus, you put it in the blood. And if the body says, if the blood says, yes, I'm protected, it's a yes or no. You either have an antibody response or you don't have an antigen antibody response. I like yes, no titer test best because it takes the whole obsessing about what level the titer is and what if it gets too low, how there's, and here's the hard part. There's really not a functional way right now in veterinary medicine to measure the anamnistic response. My hope is that we can get there. This memory cell response, if we could measure memory cells, we'd be done with this issue. But for right now, my favorite diagnostic technique to measure titers is called IFA because it's a yes, your dog is protected or no, they're not. And then the, there's no argument it's done and it's over and we can move along our merry way. Um, so that just helps with the anxiety of watching a dog's titer drop in one way. I'm really happy that if you're measuring parva distemper titers and the levels are dropping, that means your dog has not encountered another dog with parva distemper. Good. But that doesn't mean your dog's not protected. It means that your dog, the, his body hasn't seen parvo or distemper, therefore titers are dropping. That doesn't mean he's unprotected. It just means he's going to have a lower titer. And it also doesn't mean you need to revaccinate. So using IFA technology, this is a 3.0 conversation. People are like, oh my gosh, too much information. But for you, it will make sense. And, and you'll appreciate the yes, no answer part of it to help, to help remove some of the guesswork. Yeah, I know. This is amazing couple more things before we leave the vaccine conversation here. One being, you mentioned that specific window that vaccines need to be administered in puppies once they are not getting the maternal antibodies and before they build up their own immunity. How often are, are vets these days vaccinating? Obviously, this is, you don't have a specific percentage, but how often would you say puppies are getting vaccinated when they're still getting the maternal antibodies and then they're not only taking on these heavy metals that they don't need to be, but they're getting a vaccine that's ineffective. A lot. So uh, I'll just speak from my own experience. When I was a vet, before I went to vet school, I was a vet tech at my local animal shelter. When we would get litters of puppies in, the animal shelter protocol was to vaccinate at four, four weeks, six weeks eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, and 16 weeks, six puppy shots because parvo and distemper, distemper, not as much, but parvo outbreaks in shelters happen all the time. It's a crisis. It's devastating because it's up to a 90% death rate. It's devastating and it's highly infectious. So to prevent puppies from getting parvo, we vaccinated every two weeks up until 16 weeks. And what the theory is, Jesse, that as at one at some point, you can't look at a puppy and see when maternal antibody is going to go away. It's not like suddenly you can physically see it. So what the premise is, is that sometime along this process, maternal antibody is going to dip and every two weeks we're vaccinating. So at some point, one of these vaccines is going to kick 
and start the, the immunologic response that we want to build antibody production. The problem is that six cc's, six milliliters of antigen in a one pound animal, it's a lot. Now, the first animal hospital I ever worked at, their protocol was six, eight, 10, and 12 weeks. So four vaccines, not six. Every animal hospital is different. M many animal hospitals want to sell you a puppy package, which means you get five dewormings, five vaccines, five flea and tick chemicals, and five heartworm pills for X amount of dollars. And initially, be our consumer mindset would be, if I bought all these things separately, it would be X amount of money, but my veterinarian's packaging all of this together and I'm saving 500 bucks. I'm totally going to do that. The downside is that's not necessarily immunologically a wise idea at all. And now your listeners are able to knit that together. That it so that sounds like 50% off of that bundle sounds amazing, but it's not it may not serve your animal immunologically long-term at all. So just something to think about before you get the um, puppy package uh, at, at your local vet. And this is another high-level question for the 3.0 pet parents out there. For somebody who is going to get the the triple vaccine in the right time frame for the puppy, is it possible, and would this be something you'd advocate for, splitting that up into three different vaccines so it's not such a hit on the system at one time? Such a So this is, I love this conversation so much. I have done both in my, so in, in, in my world, I have single parvo. You can get single vaccines. So you're just introducing just parvo with its antigen. And then you can give the immune system a break, maybe do a little detox and then do a distemper with an antigen. And I did that for about 10 years, Jesse. I can't say why I ended up pivoting. I feel like it was, I feel like when I, my concern immunologically are, is the antigen. It's how many milliliters of metals are we injecting into fragile brand new immune systems that may not be immunocompetent that could potentially have a negative reaction in terms of being either hyperstimulated and or storing these metals inappropriately in their body. So I pivoted in about early 2000s. I pivoted to, we can get parvo distemper and adeno. We can get a three-way vaccine versus this is another question. When you go in with your puppy, you want to ask your veterinarian, what vaccines are you giving? Most veterinarians are giving a parvo distemper, adenovirus, parainfluenza, four in one, and then could be corona and then lepto. There's six in one vaccines. There's someone just told me they're thinking about coming out with an eight in one vaccine. There's six in one vaccine, six different viruses in one syringe, five different viruses in one syringe four different viruses in one syringe and three different viruses in one syringe. We can split those all up, but then the, but then the, the antigen load, the metal load is higher. So I, in my practice, uh, do the three way that for the three core viruses, parvovirus, adenovirus, and distemper, I give a three way vaccine, uh, twice. That's, that is my own protocol. I used to split them up, but I felt like it was just too much antigen. So I'm giving one antigen with a three-way vaccine twice. And that is, that, that is what I am doing. But Got it. So you're, you, you're looking at it from a metal perspective. So you're putting the yeah. three together. So in the end, there's going to be less heavy metals. Right. I also will say that veterinarians that the, usually veterinarians buy six in one vaccines. And so your veterinarian is probably going to say, unless they are functionally trained, your vet's going to say, all we have is the six in one lady or dude, do we got a six in one vaccine? Do you want it or not? Most conventionally trained veterinarians have one vaccine option and that's it. And it's kind of the all in one Dr. Gene Dodds, who's an immun a veterinary immunologist calls it the combo wombo vaccine, where you kind of throw all the viruses in the kitchen sink at a dog at six, eight, 10, 12, and 14 weeks. And that can be an immunologic nightmare long-term. So the three core vaccines that 
are necessary are parvo, distemper, and adeno. And that can be done in one syringe twice. And then your dog should, if he's immunologically normal, be protected for life, as long as the vaccines are timed appropriately with an immune system that's capable of responding. And I forget the names. You mentioned a bunch of other vaccine options that could yes. be part of the combo. I'm yes. assuming they can be separate. Is this something you advocate for or with certain dogs living in certain areas? Such a How good does somebody question. assess that whole array of options mm. and what they actually need? So this goes back to, your listeners have heard me say core vaccines. Those are the vaccines that puppies need to not die of the most common communicated diseases. So core, parvo, distemper, adeno. These extra vaccines that are offered that some veterinarians are more I don't want to say push, but it kind of feels like a push. Some vac some veterinarians are saying, listen, you've got to, you have to give the lepto vaccine and you have to give, you have to give, um, coronavirus and you have to give Lyme vaccine. You have to give all of these vaccines to be ultimately protected against everything that we know about that could possibly injure your dog. Here's the problem with some of what we call the non-core vaccines. So first of all, like kennel cough, Kennel cough is a blend of a bunch of different bacteria and a bunch of different viruses that can cause a cold in dogs. It's nearly impossible to vaccinate against bacterial infections very well. It just doesn't work very well. That's one of the reasons, Jesse, that tetanus is a bacteria. One of the reasons that people have to keep getting tetanus shots is it doesn't last very long. It's hard to vaccinate the body against bacteria because we have... We're, we're a lot of bacteria is naturally in us. We have more bacteria in our GI tracts than we do the rest of the cells in our body. There's a lot of bacterial things happening. So vaccinating against kennel cough is not a highly effective option. And one that there again, I there's just not a reason to do it because it's not really a vaccinatable disease. Now, veterinarians, boarding facilities, and groomers sometimes require Kennecoff vaccines to bounce liability away from them. If you're a groomer and if you say your dog has to have Kennecoff vaccine, then what that means is you can't blame me if you bring your dog to me and your dog goes home and next week starts sniffling and coughing. I can say, nope, not didn't get it here. I have a I have a vaccine policy mandate. Well, here's the frustrating thing. The Dr. Ron Schultz, the immunologist that, that set up most of these protocols, he told me that kennel cough was a non-vaccinatable disease. It doesn't, yes, you can, va you can give it, but it doesn't prevent the dog from getting kennel cough. It bounces liability away from the vaccinator. So your dog can still get vaccinated for kennel cough and get kennel cough. And it happens all the time, all the time. So what I have done in my practice, as I say to my clients, listen, if, if the if the boarding facility requires it, we're going to do the, there are two, two different kennel cough vaccines. There's a nose drop and an injectable kennel cough vaccine. The nose drop is not adjuvanted. There's no adjuvant in it. So you just put this drop up their nose. There's no metals in it. And so if you have to get a kennel cough vaccine, get the nose drop because there's no metal. Okay, fine. What are you out? 50 bucks. You have to drop 50 bucks for an unnecessary, I don't want to say worthless vaccine, but it is a vaccine that's not very effective. And so if you have to play the game to board your dog, do the nose drop, pay the 50 bucks, and your dog may or may not get kennel cough because he did or didn't get the vaccine. So that's the silly game you play with the liability issue with bordering, boarding and grooming and sometimes airlines. Don't Sorry, I was going to jump in and ask about rabies because this is one as Canadians, we travel across the border to the States. And that's the only one they care about seeing paperwork for. Yes. So yeah. I noticed you haven't mentioned it yet. What do you think about getting that done? And and is this something that we can titer for? And I guess you might not know this, but is that something that when we cross the border, we can show titers and that can be valuable to go through? Or So I do a lot of rabies titers, but they are not acknowledged by law. I do rabies titers because I want to make sure that my indoor house cats, that literally how you get rabies is being bit by another rabid animal. Like that's the way that rabies is communicated is blood transfer from an infected animal that bites your animal and then your dog or cat can get rabies. So my indoor house cats, their likelihood of acquiring any type of disease is zero because they're strictly inside. They don't go out and fight with other tomcats. They don't go out and hunt bats. They're not playing with skunks. They have none of those scenarios that could cause rabies to be communicated to them. So I do rabies titers on all animals that have very minimal risk. But the fact is this, Jesse, rabies is required by law in 
most in, in Canada and in the US, it's required by law. So whether you want to titer or you don't want to titer, you're either going to break the law or you're not going to break the law. You have to have a rabies vaccine because it's required by both countries. Now, there's a one-year rabies vaccine and there's a three-year rabies vaccine. Remember how I told you back in the day in the early 1900s when we set all vaccine protocols, we went to a year and then we stopped? That's how the one-year rabies vaccine got approved for one year. And then here's the difference. They made, because rabies is a zoonotic disease, humans can get it. The whole reason that it's mandated that your dog and cat by law have to have rabies is because if your animals get infected, they could harm us. And so it, the rabies vaccine is a human health issue. It's not really about how toxic your dogs or cats are from it. It really, the government only cares about it being a human communicable disease. So to limit human exposure, we hyper-vaccinate our pets. That's kind of the truth of the matter. The one-year rabies vaccine, people started challenging that. They're like, listen, I think it's bull. So I don't want to give it. I, I don't want to give my rabies vaccine every year. So then institutions did a three-year rabies challenge and the three-year vaccine was approved. Right now, those are the, the only two options. What I can tell you personally, having titered my animals for rabies, is that rabies vaccine typically lasts much, much longer, much longer than three years. But it doesn't matter because the law says you have to give it every three years. Now, here's my best advice for rabies. The one-year product and the three-year product, the exact same vaccine exactly the same. So everyone listening to this podcast, get the three-year vaccine. It's not three times stronger. It's not three times more potent. They just did the clinical trial for three years instead of one year, and the dogs were also protected. So they got a label approval for three years. Get the three-year vaccine because that's a whole lot less vaccines over the course of your dog's lifetime. Get the three-year vaccine. And it stinks so bad because does it, does the vaccine last longer than that? Yes. Can you do a rabies titer? It goes to Kansas State University rabies lab. Yes, you can. The The state and provincial laws don't allow for rabies titers at this time. There are many people doing grassroots movement and Dr. John Robb has put together Protect the Pets. It's a, it's a nonprofit coalition to try and raise awareness for the acceptance of rabies titers, both at the state and national level. He's making some headway, but the fact is it's still required by law. Frustrating, but true. Great info there on the three versus one, though. So when I jumped in and brought up rabies, I think you were on a tangent there and you're about to maybe bring up lepro. Was there more you had on all that? Yeah, lepto, lepto and Lyme both. So some of these other non-core vaccines like lepto and Lyme, leptospira is a, a bacteria that naturally has existed for all of millennia. There are over 200 serovars, two, 200 different types of leptospira bacteria. They typically exist in moist soil, waterways. It likes moist, damp environments. So leptobacteria like to live in the woods, creeks, streams. So if you have a dog, um, fields, I grew up in Iowa, a lot of lepto in Iowa, a a lot of lepto in Nova Scotia, uh, where I also practice intermittently. So there's leptos out there. But here's the kicker. Both the Lyme vaccine, which is also a bacterin, it, it's a vaccine for bacteria, and the lepto vaccine, which is a vaccine against bacteria. First of all, uh, there's 200 different types of lepto there's a good chance that the lepto that your dog or cat was exposed to is not going to be protected with the vaccine because there's it's a little bit like the flu shot. There's thousands of different strains of flu shots. And if the CDC guesses right and picks the top strains, you might be protected. But statistically speaking, it's a guessing game. It's literally roulette when it comes to what do they think is going to be the infectious disease of the year. And then they put together a vaccine and hope that they guessed right. We don't even guess in veterinary medicine. We have a standard lepto vaccine. And out of the 200 different types of lepto, we pick the top four and then we vaccinate dogs for that. However, it doesn't prevent dogs from getting lepto. Jesse, it prevents dogs from shedding lepto. And there again, because leptospira is a communicable disease to humans, humans also can get lepto. Um, veterinarians will say, you and your kids could be at risk of getting lepto. You don't want that. Let's vaccinate your dog. And so vaccinated dogs against lepto shed less lepto in their urine, but it doesn't prevent them from getting lepto infection. So here's my suggestion. Leptobacteria have a very clear set of symptoms, including profound and acute fever, malaise, 
and lethargy. So if you have an active dog, like this is what I do. This is what I do. My dogs are out. They drink from puddles. They swim in lakeways. They live their best life. Just, just living it. They are unvaccinated for lepto. When I say my dogs, I, I, I step mom care for some dogs in Nova Scotia. And I have one dog here. My dog here is digging and drinking gross water and little puddles, all of these sources of lepto. He's got all of this exposure coming in and I would never vaccinate my dog for lepto. But what I know are the signs of leptospirosis and symptoms of leptospirosis. If all of a sudden, after my dog was at the park, drinking from the gross, disgusting, stagnant water, if Homer ran a fever couldn't get up one morning and was drinking a lot of water. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're on, your body's on fire. You're sucking down the water. What's going on? That is, those are symptoms that you would immediately go to your vet for. And when veterinarians take an animal in and say, hey, what's their background? And you say, we go to the park and we drink water. And now your dog has 104 degree fever and is drinking a bunch of, you know, drinking a bunch of water and profoundly lethargic, more bun, unable to stand up we will run a lepto test. And here's the good news. In my 25-year career, I've had two dogs test positive for lepto and on appropriate antibiotics, they were both cured. How lepto kills dogs, Jesse, and this, this is actually a great way to circle back to the very beginning of our conversation. And this is a great way to maybe wrap up. Do not ignore your dog's symptoms. When you hear about lepto killing dogs and lepto does kill dogs, so does Lyme disease. Lyme and lepto both kill dogs. Those vaccines don't prevent your dogs from getting lepto or Lyme. So as a functional medicine vet, it's hard for me to say, give more vaccines if it's not protecting them. And the, those vaccines don't offer incredible protection, unfortunately. So it's, I don't recommend them because they're not wildly protective. What I do recommend is people recognize symptoms in their dogs. And we can, for lepto, immediately, the second that you can tell that your dog's drinking more, peeing more, lethargic, take them to the vet, right? This is, this goes back to your dog giving you symptoms. Don't ignore symptoms. And when I have read horrible cases, I've never had a patient die of lepto, but I certainly know vets that have. It's those pet parents that say, you know, today he's not looking good, not standing up. Maybe tomorrow will be better. Tomorrow comes around, well, he drank a little less. He still doesn't, he's just not doing well. I'm going to wait one more day. And one more day turns into one more day, turns into one more day. And those dogs die of lepto. So don't do that. Here's what's cool about Lyme disease. The best defense against Lyme disease, and this is a really good tip to end on. Back in the olden days, we just recommended a heartworm test every year. And I still do. But as of 2000, there's an easy, simple heartworm plus test that automatically checks for Lyme disease. And there is way more Lyme disease in the world than there is heartworm, way more. So in, so my, my best take-home proactive wellness tip for your listeners, this podcast is replace your standard outdated heartworm test with either a 40X test, that's the branded name of a heartworm test plus a Lyme test, done through IDEX labs or an Accuplex test, which is a heartworm. It's That's the Antec version. There's two labs, IDEX and Antec. They both make a heartworm test plus a Lyme test. One is called 40X, one is called an Accuplex. It doesn't matter which one you use. They both do the same thing. They're competitors. But basically, it's a heartworm test plus a Lyme test every year. Checking for Lyme disease every year is one of the most, if you live in North America, it's one of the most important things you can do because long before Lyme disease starts to show up in our dog's bodies, we can catch it on a simple and easy blood test and treat it quite easily and effectively before your dog has symptoms. So you asked at the beginning, what tests should we be doing? One of those annual tests that I recommend everyone do is a 40X or Accuplus test to check not only for heartworm, but for the much more common tick-borne diseases that are epidemic in North America right now. It's one of the best gifts you can give yourself for my dog does not have tick-borne disease or, woo. and I will tell you, I think I told you back when I had a pack of five dogs in Chicago, every summer I had a dog test positive for a tick-borne disease. Now they they just tested positive on paper. They were running. They were still doing agility. They felt great. I would have no idea. I pull ticks off my dogs all the time. So knowing that I'm pulling ticks off my dogs, I'm going to check for tick-borne diseases. But even if you are not pulling ticks off your dogs, you can run one of these tests 
Make sure that your dog is not dealing with a subclinical tick-borne disease. And it's such an easy, simple way to buy peace of mind for yourself, but also know that you can go out, live your best life with your dog, take them hiking, take them deep into the woods, let them swim, let them live their best lives. Could you bump and could you pick a tick off you? Yeah, it's the downside of playing in the woods. Could you pick a tick off your tick off your dog? Uh-huh. It's okay. Go to the woods anyway. Live your best life with your dog and just check them for tick-borne diseases once a year. And it's this easy, simple test that I believe should be automatically swapped for a heartworm test that just buys you peace of mind that your dog is not dealing with a tick-borne disease. And it's an easy, simple way to live your best life with some confidence that you're not missing anything. It's a good way. We kind of we kind of came full circle there. Yeah, that is so important because I've been living, we've been living with our dog in a way where we're avoiding the woods, letting yeah. Goji run off leash. And we've pulled a few ticks over the years off of her and had the ticks tested. And this just makes a lot more sense. So oh, once you have yes. this test done and what you're saying to make sure I understand that correctly is if you have this done once a year and you find something that's a tick-borne illness, you can treat it at that time, nip it in the bud and then move on. Okay. Yes. But we're going to leave with one last tip. This, this simple, easy heartworm plus test that I, hopefully all of your listeners are going to do now this, this lie, this Lyme and heartworm test combo. It's a screening test for Lyme exposure, Jesse, which means if your dog had Lyme exposure, then your dog was bit by a tick that contained the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi. That's the genus and species of the etiologic agent that causes Lyme disease, Borrelia. It's the bacteria, it's a spirochete bacteria that most ticks have. Being that it's a bacteria, if your dog, they estimate, Jesse, 90% of dogs that are bit by positive ticks clear the infection themselves. So just because your dog was bit by a tick that has Lyme disease doesn't mean your dog's going to get Lyme disease. Your dog's immune system could be like, absolutely not, and modern immune response and obliterate the Borrelia. That's what should happen. So there's one intermediate step between you do the test. And the reason I'm saying this is that I want pet parents listening to this podcast. Veterinarians don't know this and veterinarians mistreat Lyme exposure for Lyme infection all the time, all the time. So what do I mean by that? If you request one of this Heartworm Plus Lyme tests, either 4DX or Accuplex, those are the two brand names. So you request one, your vet says, yes, your dog comes back positive for one of these screening tests, your vet most likely is going to be like, oh my gosh, we need to do 30 days of doxycycline. Your dog tested positive. But I want your listeners to know that your dog tested positive for the screening test, which means your dog has had exposure. Exposure doesn't equal disease. Exposure means your dog was bit by a tick that contained the bacteria. If your dog tests positive on that screening test, and your vet says, oh my gosh, you're, the dog tested positive on the screening test. Your response is going to be, okay, now let's find out if his immune system did what it should do, which is clear the bacteria. I want you to do a, di- a follow-up diagnostic test with the same blood sample. So right now the blood samples at the lab, they, they found that the dog tested positive for screening. The lab's holding the blood. Your vet calls and says, your dog tested positive on the screening test. Our response as owners needs to be like, okay, now I want to find out if he actually is infected or if he just had exposure. Because if he had exposure, 90% of dogs that have exposure clear the infection on their own. If your dog has Lyme disease, they are in the 10% of dogs that didn't clear the infection and now they have infection with Borrelia. And how do you discern exposure versus infection? When your vet says, hey, your dog tested positive, you request a follow-up sample from the lab be run called a QC6 test, a quantitative C6. Quantitative C6 test is the follow-up test that confirms that you have Lyme infection or Lyme exposure. And I can't tell you how many times my clients, my proactive wellness 2.0, 3.0 pet parents, my the people that I'm educating, they're like, listen, that bit of information saved my dog 30 days of unnecessary antibiotics. My vet didn't even know that there was a difference between an infectious test and an exposure test. So the test that we're running is just checking to see if your dog's been bit by a positive tick. 
Yes. If the answer is yes, my dog was bit by a positive tick. Now we're going to ask the question, is he or she infected? How are we going to know if she, if she or he's infected? We're going to ask for a QC6. If the QC6 test comes back positive, Jesse, your dog has Lyme disease. And then you go to the CIVTEDU.org website. You find yourself a proactive functional medicine doc that is, uh, that, that treat, that's what we call Lyme literate, knows how to treat Lyme disease. And you do a telemedicine consult. It's pretty darn easy to get rid of Lyme some clinically. It's impossible to get rid of Lyme two years down the road when your dog finally has Lyme arthritic changes in the joints. They're, that's it. We, we will never cure your dog of Lyme disease and his quality of life has been diminished and he's had this infection that we could have treated easily when he was asymptomatic and prevented de joint, uh, degenerative joint disease and the kidney disease and all of the other things that go along with chronic Lyme syndrome. Chronic Lyme disease is a result of veterinarians not testing for Lyme disease. And so why wouldn't we just do that every year? We're all exposed. We might as well all test if your dog screens that he's had exposure, do a follow-up test to find out if they're actually infected. Most dogs are not infected with Lyme. They just have been exposed. But knowing the difference is really important. You just shattered my whole paradigm on ticks and Lyme. And that's incredible information. Good. And Karen, I know you got to go, but just to come full circle on the vaccine piece, this is my last question in that realm. And I had, just like last time, I have a ton more stuff I want to get into. Maybe we can do another round down the line and get into that. But let's, if you have this minute, let's close the the chapter on vaccines. And this is for the 3.0 parents or for pet parents who may be getting dogs later in life and they've been getting vaccines on a regular basis and maybe they've been accumulating those metals. What I'm getting into is detox. So for the 3.0 pet parent who is waiting for their puppy to be in that proper window, they're getting the the vaccine. Is there stuff they can do before, during, or after to help with the metals? Mm -hmm. And then secondarily, a different group of people that are getting a dog later in life that may have accumulated these metals because Mm -hmm. they've been on a regular vaccine type program. How do we help these detox? How do we help these dogs Detox. detox the metals or prevent them from accumulating? And actually, it's the same protocol, Jesse, whether you have a puppy or whether you have a dog. I adopted a Rottweiler uh, when I first moved to Chicago and set up my proactive animal hospital. I adopted an eight-year-old Rottweiler that had, vac- that had been vaccinated 12 times in eight years. And so I immediately, I saw that. I was like, oh my God, uh, 12 12 rabies vaccines because there was some confusion. She had been in and out of rescue. And every single time that she went back into rescue, they just automatically gave her another rabies vaccine. So once the records all got accumulated, I was like, oh my gosh, she had been over and unnecessarily vaccinated many times. So this, the protocol is the same. I use a combination of homeopathic detoxes because I, uh, I just have seen that they, I believe that I, that they work well for my patients. Homeopathy is certainly controversial and people that are anti-homeopathy say, oh my gosh, homeopathy doesn't work. But what I say to my clients are, listen, at worst case scenario, you wasted 12 bucks, but best case scenario, if you believe homeopathy could do something, it's the cheapest, easiest, simplest detox in the world. So if you are familiar with homeopathy, it's based on the premise of like cures like. So Thuya is the vaccine detox for parvo and distemper. It's the, it's a remedy. T H U J A is how it's spelled. And it's the, it's the vaccine detox that you give after a dose of parvo or distemper. If you want to detox from the rabies vaccine, they take saliva from a rabbit animal, they dilute it out, the homeopathic facilities dilute it out, you know, uh, 200 times or more, and then you give these microscopic doses back to the dog to help the body detox from unnecessary rabies. So that remedy is called LYSSEN. L-Y-S-S-I-N. So parvo distemper puppies, I always send them home with a dose of Thuya after each, you know, those two vaccines, they get a dose of Thuya. When I vaccinate for rabies, those adult dogs or puppies get a dose of Listen. 
with the instructions to provide chlorella. Chlorella is a natural super green food that is a, is a chelator. It binds heavy metals and pulls them out of the body. So I'm a big believer in using chlorella for helping to bind the aluminum or mercury that's found in vaccines. So chlorella is part of the super green food detox family that works really well for metals all types of metals. So let's just say that you find out that you've got arsenic or lead in your water source. Chlorella will help with that. So I use a combination of chlorella for helping to remove the metals from the vaccines, as well as an herb called milk thistle. Now, milk, where some of these metals are stored in the body uh, can be all over, specifically in the fat, but also the liver is the first organ that has to, when the liver's hit with mercury or aluminum, the liver has to do something with it. And the liver has this amazing phase one detoxification and phase two detoxification, which is how the liver gets bundles and processes these environmental toxins and then pushes them out of the system. And milk thistle is used to assist the liver in detoxifying some of these metals. So chlorella will help pull the metals out of the GI tract and prevent them from, be, let's say if your animal's eating them, but also then chlorella is absorbed in the, into the bloodstream and it helps chelate or pull metals out of the bloodstream Milk thistle will help the liver bundle these metals and then excrete them in the bile where they're pooped out. So I use milk thistle and chlorella as herbs and supplements to assist with detoxification. In addition to two homeopathic remedies that I have used for years and find that that combination of both works the best, whether it's a puppy or an adult dog. All right, just to cover the three core ones again, it's parvo, distemper. What was the third one? Adenovirus. Adenovirus causes hep infectious hepatitis or infectious liver disease in, in dogs. And adenovirus uh, is rare. It does not, I, it does not happen very often. I have seen in my 25 years, I've seen one case of adenovirus in, in my career. Parvovirus happens the most frequently, and it's the biggest risk. For puppies because parvovirus is absolutely out and about in the environment. And because it's so highly infectious, unimmunized puppies are at high risk for acquiring parvovirus. And the death rate in puppies is very, very high from parvo. So for me as a practicing veterinarian, it's parvovirus that scares me the most for puppies up until six months of age. Got it. And when you mentioned the homeopathics, you mentioned two different ones there. We'll link them up in the show notes. One of them was for two of the core vaccines. And I think the other one was for rabies. You got it. Is there one for the other piece of the core vaccines? So so all of the, actually core or non-core, thuya, thuya, you can use for parvo distemper adeno. And then if you're, and then let's just say that you, you end up having to get that six way. So you're getting, your veterinarian's giving corona and parainfluenza in that combo wombo vaccine, you're going to give Thuya for that entire set of vaccines. And then listen is the detox for rabies. So it's either Thuya for all of the vaccines except rabies or listen for the rabies vaccine. And you can use Thuya and listen together. One thing I don't recommend is that when you bring your adult dog in, many veterinarians say, Hey, we're going to give all these vaccines at one time. If you are going to vaccinate your animal, for rabies and anything else, I recommend that you split those up and you don't give any, don't give more than one vaccine at any one time. Give one vaccine, go home and detox the body, make sure you don't see a reaction, all is well, then schedule the rabies booster in two or three weeks, but don't, don't stack up vaccines. Cause if your dog or cat has a reaction, we don't know to which one. So if you split them up, we're able to better assess our animals, individualized reactions to those vaccines. All right, Karen, I'm going to let you go. We're going to link up forever dog, link up your website, link social media, everything in the show notes. And I think this is, yeah, this is our round four. So this was great. Got into the weeds, covered the details on a lot of different things. Thank That's you good. for coming back on the show. No problem, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Now that you're done here, you're going to want to stick around and catch my previous chat with Karen over here, where we go deep into diet and supplementation for your dog. You're not going to want to miss this. I'll see you over there. If we put all of these things together into intentionally creating a life.